on the dot. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have about 75 people already popped in and quite a few people loading in as we speak. So thank you all. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining ATIA today as we get a chance to learn some natural history for the Alaska Guides. We have a lot to cover in a really short amount of time, so I'm going to keep the introductions brief. First, let me start by thanking our sponsor, the Alaska Eps Corps, um, funded by NSF and the State of Alaska, the National Science Foundation program established to stimulate competitive research. We um, will have a lot of that information out there for you, and I will share it in the text chat for you if you have any questions about that program. Um, I also wanted to thank today our presenters. We've got five fabulous presenters for you. Rick Tumman, an expert on the Alaska climate weather who works for UAF's International Arctic Research Center. Marian Snively is a wildlife biologist who is currently serving as the wildlife education and outreach specialist for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and will be presenting on the uniqueness of bears in Alaska. Eric Klein is a professor at UAA and will present on Alaska's glaciers. Brandon Brown is a geologist at the Alaska Vol uh, Volcano Observatory and will present on Alaska's volcanoes. And last but not least, Omega Smith is the manager and lead presenter at the UAA Planetarium and Visualization Theater and will be presenting on the Aurora Borealis. Each presenter will take turns sharing information and if time permits folks, because we know we've got lots of great questions and information coming our way, if time permits, we will get through as many questions as we can. We encourage you to share your questions in that Q&A feature for us and we'll gather them up. And at the end of each section, we'll address as many questions as we can within that time frame. The webinar is going to be recorded and at the end, we'll share it at the alaskatia.org website. With that, it is my pleasure to pass it over to our first presenter, Rick Tumman. All right, great. Thank you very much and thanks for uh, everyone uh, who's online taking time out of your day. So the theory is here that uh, if we make the technology work, you can see my title slide. Is that correct? We can see it. All right. Okay. So I've been asked to talk about Alaska climate change for uh, the tourist industry. And so we'll jump right in. So Alaska and the Arctic, the climate, the environment is changing. We see it all around us from sea ice declines and warming oceans, earlier springs, more frequent big fires. We'll hear more about glaciers coming up and all kinds of ecological changes that we can see with our eyes that are completely independent of how we measure anything. And so this is gonna, this is a very big topic, of course, of climate change more advanced in Alaska than nearly anywhere else in the United States. And so visitors are, if they're not aware of it, they may well see it. So just to give you some background, here's uh, to how temperatures and uh, on the left, precipitation on the right have changed at the annual scale over the last 50 years. There's nothing magical about 50 years. We kind of pick that because that's something like the best part of an adult working memory. Uh, some of the, the folks that you'll be dealing with can remember 1971. If we push it back into the 1930s, nobody can relate to that now. So that's the only reason we pick 50 years. What I wanna point out in this slide, all of Alaska is warming, but that warming is not uniform. Warming is greatest in Northern and Western Alaska and less, but still significant in Southeast Alaska and in the Aleutians with the very ocean dominated climate. Precipitation on the right hand side, much more variable. Precipitation is increasing in all of the regions of Alaska, but in some areas it's more significant than others over the last uh, 50 years. So this is at the annual scale. If we drill down now in time, down to the seasonal scale, and so winter is in the upper left-hand corner, spring upper right, summer uh, bottom left, and fall on the bottom right. And you can see easily here, it's, it's the same color scale on all these graphics. Temperatures are increasing over the last 50 years, most dramatically in the winter, but really every season except for summer, their changes are really dramatic. Less changes in the, uh, in the summertime 
uh, in most areas. That is to say the magnitude of the change is less than in the uh, colder part of the year. But again, you'll see these significant regional differences and that's uh, in part just because Alaska is a really big place spanning, uh, spanning uh, quite a bit of latitude and longitude uh, range, of course. So what does it mean? What's actually the impact of warming air, air temperatures, warming seasons? Well, we'll see more about glaciers, but I just had to throw this, this uh, one slide up here. Of course, almost all glaciers in Alaska are, uh, are losing ice mass, uh, and many are retreating, some very uh, dramatically. And here's a nice 50-year uh, nice uh, change here of the Golcana Glacier, uh, which you can more or less see from uh, parts of the uh, Richardson Highway. Those of you in South Central are probably well aware of uh, spruce bark beetle damage. Spruce bark beetles are not an invasive species. They've been present in low numbers, especially on the Kenai Peninsula for a very long time. But they, in recent years, the amount of damage they're producing and their aerial range has been increasing. And this is mostly a climate-driven issue, spreading north because we're not getting temperatures low enough at the right time of year to kill them, and then that's exacerbated by warm and dry summers. But it's a large part uh, due to uh, the, the lack of really low temperatures at the right time of year that kill uh, those, uh, those uh, spruce bark beetles. Again, without the warming climate, we wouldn't be seeing this advance of the spruce bark beetle. Thawing permafrost is a big deal. Um, in the long run, th permafrost is all about air temperature. In the shorter time scale, years, even a few decades, things like local ground cover can slow or accelerate that thaw. But in the long run, it's all about air temperature. And so we have things um, here in interior Alaska where uh, you have structures uh, built on improperly on permafrost. Uh, they don't last very long. This famous, the permafrost house in Fairbanks. Uh, along the Dalton Highway, uh, we have areas uh, in the bottom uh, left there, the image showing uh, basically the, the slow motion landslide as permafrost thaws headed down towards the road and, uh, and sinkholes uh, as well. Many people don't know the majority of state maintained roads in Alaska are built on areas of discontinuous or continuous permafrost, and that makes it uh, very, very expensive because those are the kinds of repairs uh, from thawing permafrost underneath roadbeds that have to be done repeatedly, the same thing uh, year after year. Another place that, uh, that uh, visitors may see uh, evidence of our warming seasons, uh, the so-called drunken forests in the interior of Alaska. Uh, this nice picture here showing uh, the cattywampus uh, black spruce. And these uh, trees uh, get out of line here when they're on ground, underlain by ice wedges. When those ice wedges thaw and drain away, we have this land subsidence, quite dramatic. And uh, we wind up with these uh, trees going every which uh, direction. Direct result of the warming climate melting the ice that underlies uh, this ground. It's not just the air that's warming, the oceans are warming too. Here's a snapshot uh, for the month of July showing the ch total change in uh, typical temperatures uh, between 1979 and 2020. So over that 42 uh, year period, you can see almost everywhere in the oceans around Alaska, uh, temperatures are warming. The very dramatic increases in Western Alaska, in Norton Sound, in Kotzebue Sound, along the Northwest Chukchi Sea Coast. Those are all related to changes in sea ice, which we'll get to in a minute, having very dramatic impacts. But you'll notice even in the Gulf of Alaska and Southeast Alaska, uh, temperatures are warming. And this is having dramatic, dramatic effects, not just on the climate, although it's having a big effect on the climate, but things that live in the sea and come from the sea. And so, Paralytic shellfish poisoning and harmful algal blooms 
are now occurring in places that they were either very rare or didn't occur uh, before. It's not new in Alaska, parts of Southeast Alaska, Gulf of Alaska coast. This has been a long, this has always been an issue. There are traditional place names in Southeast Alaska that appear to refer to um, the occurrence of this kind of thing. But we're seeing these spread west uh, into the Aleutians and north into the Bering Sea, such that the state of Alaska in 2019 had to conduct training for community health aides in the northern Bering Sea coast on these signs of paralytic shellfish poisoning, because that has not been an issue before. But the oceans are now warm enough uh, near coastal uh, northern Bering Sea, Alaska, that this is a potential threat. This is being driven entirely by the warming oceans. Between the thawing permafrost and warming oceans, decreasing sea ice, we also see changes in our landscape. Uh, the most, some of the most dramatic uh, large chunks of land falling off on the North Slope Coast, the Beaufort Sea Coast, east, east of Utkiagvik, where uh, we have these large chunks of land. You can see several of these uh, pieces of land just falling into the sea as that, that white there, that's frozen uh, ice rich ground is being un undercut by the water in this area where uh, there's dramatically less ice than there was even 20 years ago. And so uh, places east of Utkiagvik there are losing tens uh, to hundred feet of land a year. And there's already been cultural resources uh, lost as a result of these kind of changes. Now at sea ice, the loss of sea ice is really the elephant in the room in climate change for much of Alaska. Uh, on the left-hand side here, I have a graphic showing what uh, ice was typically like in mid-November, uh, back at the start of our satellite records, which start in uh, the fall of 1978. And you can see that uh, the Chukchi Sea there, north of the Bering Sea, mostly had ice. Norton Sound around Nome there mostly had ice. And on the right-hand side is the most recent 10 years. And you can see a huge amount of area that previously had ice only 30 years ago had ice is now open water. This, is ha this has a dramatic effect in uh, the climate. In fact, there's enough heat coming off of that open water in the Chukchi Sea in the fall to warm the entire Arctic by one degree Celsius, the entire Arctic. That is a tremendous heating pad underneath the, uh, the Arctic atmosphere. How does this impact Alaska besides warming our autumns? Most people don't realize coastal flooding is actually the single most expensive weather-related natural disaster in Alaska, like everywhere in the world, from hurricanes to, uh, to in the tropics to, to uh, fall storms in Alaska. Coastal flooding depends on storm track and the intensity of storms, ocean levels, wave actions. But in the north, historically, sea ice provided protection from uh, the, the wave action and the elevated sea levels uh, to a significant extent. And with that loss of sea ice during the stormiest time of year in the Bering and Chukchi Seas in the fall, we have much more frequent flooding. The number of storms or the intensity of the storms, if you think about storms as low pressure systems on a weather map, that has not evidently changed in the last 70 years. What's changed is the lack of sea ice and allowing these very vulnerable communities to be exposed for much, much longer. One of the big changes, of course, that uh, visitors potentially will see in the summer are wildfires. Uh, the frequency of big wildfire seasons, typically defined as a million acres or more, has about doubled since 1990. And uh, this is uh, very expensive for the state of Alaska. Million acre fires mean that folks uh, have to be brought in from Canada and the lower 48 to fight, to fight it, not just people, but equipment. That is all very expensive uh, to do, of course. It's not just about the fires themselves. We're getting more acres. We're also getting hotter fires. So this picture here from the Taylor Highway, uh, 
you can see that hillside there of, of fireweed. And if you look close, you'll see there's uh, there's sticks in there. This is a, a, air, a hillside recovering from a wildfire a few years before. But as our fires are getting hotter, they're burning deeper into that duff layer, the ground layer, and we're seeing changes in how the landscape recovers. Wildfire is not new, it's an, it's an integral part of the boreal ecosystem, but the intensity of the fires that we're getting now appears to be significantly greater than it used to be. And so this is affecting how the land recovers from those fires. And it's not just about flames, of course. Um, most Alaskans in the last few years have had experience with wildfire smoke. Graphic on the left-hand side shows just the number of hours at the Fairbanks airport where the visibility has been reduced due to smoke. And you can see a very dramatic increase uh, starting about 2000. And uh, at times it can be just really horrifically choking a uh, picture there from the terrible uh, year of 2004. And it, that's, a, that's a good representation of what it looked like. And uh, that is really unhealthy air to breathe. Perhaps not that extreme, but certainly most areas with the possible exception of the North Slope have had bouts of uh, wildfire smoke and poor air quality in the last 10 years. Finish up here, you're gonna get asked, I'm sure. Alaska is warming much faster than the lower 48, or for that matter, Europe. You're gonna get asked, why is that the case? Changes at high latitudes are amplified by the things that we've discussed here. The big driver changes in sea ice, increases in sea surface temperatures. The shorter snow cover is contributing to higher air temperatures, to, to that, those hotter fires because the ground is, is able to dry longer because of the early loss of snow cover. And in the Arctic, Warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor, and water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas. More water vapor, more warming. It's a cycle. Why is it different over the Arctic than the Antarctic? Simply because of the differences in geography. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded on three and a half sides by continents, and Antarctica is a continent sitting right over the pole, completely surrounded by ocean. The, the differences in geography account for the differences in response to uh, climate change. Finally, uh, I end up here uh, with um, this graphic here, uh, 121 years of average annual temperatures for Alaska. Uh, and uh, that's each of the dots. You can see here the way I like to do these. The 10 coldest years are in blue dots. The 10 warmest years are in red dots. You can see all of the red dots are way over on the right-hand side, all except one. Uh, and there hasn't been a coldest uh, top, a top 10 coldest year in Alaska since the 1970s. The thick green line is that long-term trend. So decade, many decades, century scale trend. When we talk about a warming climate, that's the, the green line, which comes out of this data. That's what we're talking about. But of course, there's lots of year-to-year -year variability. And that's what that black dash line indicates. When people talk about, oh, the climate's always changing, Typically, they're thinking about that black dashed line because that's at the level of uh, uh, people's uh, experience, uh, which does go up and down. But the long-term trend, which, of course, no one has a working memory of 121 years of change, um, is unequivocally uh, up. Last slide, if you are looking for resources for Alaska climate, not just climate change, but kind of the basics, uh, the best and only really real book is uh, uh, The Climate of Alaska by Martha Schultzke and Gerd Wendler. It came out in 2007. It is available online. Certainly some of the stuff on climate change is quite dated at this point, but it's still a good basic uh, introduction. Uh, um, here at IARC, we have put out two recent publications uh, focused on changes. 2019, Alaska's changing environment, and just out over the winter, Alaska's changing wildfire environment. The links are there. You can download those PDFs. Um, very useful uh, resources focused on what's happened recently. 
if you're online or want to point people to online resources uh, on social media, both myself and my colleague, Brian Brett Schneider, uh, uh, are on Twitter and we tweet a lot about, or exclusively in my case, about Alaska and Arctic weather and climate and a good way to stay uh, up to date on what's happening. That's what I've got for you. Do we have time for questions? Fantastic, thank you for sharing. Um, it looks like we don't have time for questions at this time, but I encourage everybody to share your questions in the text chat. We are gonna gather them. And then once we get through as many of our presenters as possible, if we have any extra time, we will come back and revisit those questions. Thank you so much, Rick. All right, next we'll go ahead and pass it on over. <laughs> and you're already there, great, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, hello. And so yeah, today I'll talk about um, bears and we have three types, three species of bears in Alaska. We are the only state to have all three species. And um, if you want to put in the chat box, I'm sure you all know, what are the three species of bears that we have in Alaska? And so I'm going to start with the black bear. Because of time's sake, I'm not going to go on too much about polar bear because I think a lot of most people are going to come into contact with black or brown bears. But the very last slide, um, I'll leave for you to look at and read um, about polar bears too, unless I have a little bit of time. So the, the black bear is the most abundant bear in Alaska, um, probably in North America and um, oh, lower 48 in Canada. Uh, there's about 100,000 black bears just in Alaska. It's the most widely distributed bear, um, not in Alaska, but like I said, um, in the lower 48. You can see the distribution, the range in Alaska. It looks like it's just south of the Brooks Range. Um, not into the uh, Aleutians area, but southeast interior and some coastal areas. So the general description, you might think black bear, oh yeah, they're black, that's it. But um, here's a, actually, this is a common, real common pelt of a black bear, but you can see it's got a little bit of brown on the face. Sometimes they have that, sometimes they do have a little bit of brown um, on their paws. This one's really quite black actually, but they can also come in from jet black to even white. I think it's Canada has um, white bears that are not albino. Um, you can see a lot of cinnamon bears. There's a lot I see around like when I was working as a biologist on, on J bear area, I saw some beautiful cinnamon bears. They can also be a bluish color or a glacier bear. Um, Let's see, they are the smallest of Alaska bears. <clears throat> They're about 20 inches at the shoulder. In general, they can be much bigger than that though. They're 60 inches typically from the nose to the tail and the, the uh, males typically weigh 180 to 200 pounds. But areas like Prince, Prince of Wales Island uh, commonly uh, have bears that exceed 350 pounds. Uh, of course, they're a lot lighter in weight in the spring. Uh, they have to gain a lot of weight so that they can hibernate. The profile of a black bear, let me bring this up, it's got kind of a um, rounded, like almost a Roman nose. If you put this here, put that up to there, there's just a little bit of space between the straight edge. And I'll show you a little bit about the black bear in a minute. I'm watching the time closely. Boy, it goes by fast. Uh, growth and reproduction, uh, they're solitary except during breeding season. The cubs weigh under one pound at birth, but about five, five pounds when they emerge from the den. They can have up to five cubs, but typically only have two, and they stay with their mother through the first winter. <clears throat> Unless the mother lose their cubs, they only breed about twice a year. Um, bears are sexually mature at three to six years, but a female won't be successful typically until she's quite a bit older than that. Um, so hibernation happens when food sources become scarce, their body temperature drops, their metabolic rate is reduced, they sleep for long periods of time um, during this time, and it can last in northern areas up to eight months. <clears throat> in southern areas, they can emerge during winter. Um, if they have a food source, they don't even have to hibernate at all. They're creatures of opportunity and will eat anything that they find. Their job is to 
is to gain weight, is to eat as much as they can so that they can survive another winter of hibernation. In the spring, they eat a lot of green vegetation. This actually has a lot of protein in it. Um, they'll eat, of course, uh, winter killed animals, and moose cows, um, pretty much anything they can. <laughs> Excuse me. This would be in the spring, the summer, and the fall. They eat a lot of salmon or other fish, vegetation, berries, grubs, ants, things like that. Of course, human attractants. Um, I'll touch a little bit about that a little later. Okay, so the brown bears. I couldn't find an estimate of how many brown bears are in Alaska, but it can be as high, the dens densities can be as high as one bear per mile. Uh, this is the most widely distributed uh, species in Alaska. You can see the range pretty much all over Alaska, except for some of these islands. A general description, they're similar in size to polar bears, but polar bears are, they're more streamlined. They're actually, polar bears are a marine mammal and they're streamlined so they can swim. Um, this is a common color morph of the uh, brown bear. But they can also be, um, they can be real dark, almost black. They can be really, really blonde and light. They, they're big animals. The Kodiak brown bears can be up to 1,500 pounds, um, nine feet tall, even taller than that. Males are about 30 to 50 percent larger than females. Um, I didn't show this, I meant to. This is a claw, actually, of a black bear. And you can see it's very curved. And that's so that they can climb trees to get, get away if, if their cubs or they are in trouble. This is a brown bear claw. It's longer, not so curved. And this is because they do a lot of digging um, for grubs or mammals or what have you under the ground. Okay, profile. Let's do this. This is a brown bear. And then let's do the same thing. You can see there's a lot more space between the ruler and the, the nose, the snout of the bear. So it's more convex or more uh, uh, dish faced, I'd say. I'm gonna put this up here, you can put in the chat. What do you think this is, brown or black? Okay. How much time do I have? I'm checking on my time, just a second. Okay, um, <clears throat> they're similar to uh, black bears mostly solitary, but they can form feeding groups like this picture out from McNeil. Um, but other than that, they're pretty solitary. Cubs are a little bit bigger, one to one and a half pounds at birth, and they weigh about 15 pounds when they emerge from the den. They can have one to four cubs, typically two, just like black bears. Um, the families typically stay together for about two to three years, and they're sexually mature at about five years of age. Um, their hibernation is similar to black bears. Um, they too are oppor opportunistic. They'll eat uh, grasses, like I said, high in protein. This is in the spring sedges. They'll eat calves of you know, caribou or moose or what have you in the spring. They'll eat berries, cow parsnips, roots and berries, and fish. Um, and the human attractants, I put a plug in for this, garbage, bird feeders, pet food, our livestock, fish waste, and barbecues are all really strong attractants. So if you get questions about this, if people are coming in and they're camping out, just let them know to keep that food uh, secure so bears can't get to it. This is a really cool little video. This is a, cam a study, a camera collar on a black bear. And they're getting into all kinds of attractants. And actually you can see this online. Um, I'm gonna have a, a link at the end um, that you can go to to find these videos and other information. And I also have to do a safety plug too, because I am a wildlife education specialist, big part of my job. Um, just let people know to make noise when they're out in bear country and carry bear spray, have it handy. Um, don't put in your pack and um, know how to use it. Move cautiously, especially along creeks and wine corners. So make a lot of noise, pay attention, use your senses. Don't use earbuds in your ears. You wanna be able to hear 
um, travel in group and don't spread out. And being in a bigger group really helps. Leash your pet or leave it at home. They can actually bring a bear to you. Um, they can annoy it and bring it to you. Uh, this is the uh, um, vanity site that you can go to. It's alastabears.alasta.gov. This will talk about a lot of different um, ways to be safe, what the tractants are, life history characteristics. It's just full of a lot of different things. Looks like I have a little bit of time. So the polar bear fast facts. Uh, males can weigh up to 1,200 pounds. They're not quite as heavy as a Kodiak brown bear, but still pretty big. Females can weigh up to 700 pounds, and they have a lifespan of about, of about 25 years. All the, the bear species tend to have a lifespan of somewhere around 25 years. Uh, diet of this animal are ringed and bearded seals, walruses, and belugas. So this is the one bear species that eats only um, and seems to eat only uh, meat. Oops, sorry. I ended that without meaning to. Anyway. See if I can get to it really quickly. Okay, um, they have one to three cubs every th three years. Their uh, natural predators are male uh, polar bears and, of course, humans. And so, like I said, alaskabears.alaska.gov is a really good site. You can send to uh, to people or just let them know it's there, and they can do some research on it. Okay. It looks like I have some time for questions. You do, you have about two more minutes. So okay. what questions or comments does anybody have in reference to our fabulous bears? We'll also post this information again um, in, the, in the chat for everyone to see. And then again, if we have some time at the end, which I believe we will have a little bit of time, which is great, we'll come back and address any of those questions that may pop up. All right, here's a question. How many hybrid species are in Alaska at this point? Oh, we can't hear you. I think you might have went on mute there. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what, what is the question? I don't see it. How many hybrids are there in Alaska? Yeah. I really don't know. I've never really, I know that it happens every once in a while and it'll happen when <clears throat> like you can see that on the range map, sometimes a polar bear and grizzly bear range will um, coincide. That's when it happens. I think it's really rare. I know I read about it quite a few years ago that there was one that was hunted, but I don't know if anybody really knows that. Good question. Let's sneak one more in before we pass it over. Um, one more question. Uh, now that brown bears are moving further north, are they becoming predators to polar bears? I don't think so. Um, polar bears, like I said, and brown bears are pretty much the same size. I think it might be possible, um, but I don't think bears that are so similar size would want to fight each other. Um, but yeah, it, it could happen. I'll sneak one more in that came in in reference to visitors. Where can visitors learn more um, about avoiding bears while camping? Yeah, so like I said, alaskabears.alaska.gov. It has um, camping, it has biking, it's got all different things. There are videos that we shot of Tom Griffin, who actually took some of those pictures. He's a McNeil um, River uh, technician that works up there, and he... Uh, there's videos of him using bear spray and how to avoid it. We have uh, also videos of Tom doing bear safety presentation. Uh, it's just full of things. So it's a, it's a great resource. Fantastic. We'll make sure we add that for folks to see. Thank you, Marion, for sharing. Thank you. We're now going to pass it over to Eric Klein. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all of you for uh, tuning in. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, I assume everybody can hear that or see that and hear me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about glaciers. It's a big topic. Everybody likes glaciers. I think almost everyone does. There's this inherent draw to it. Um, in Alaska, we have a lot of glaciers. I think they're just um, really interesting for many reasons, partially just visually. They're very striking, so people like to see them. And there are many places in Alaska that both Alaska residents and visitors get to. Um, so there's a, a lot of interest in trying to understand them and, and just see see glaciers as well. So we'll go over some um, basics and general overview of glaciers and some specifics to Alaska as well. So to put glaciers into a larger context, where do they come from? How are they formed? Well, they're connected to the overall water cycle. And just real briefly, water comes from the ocean, it's evaporated, it moves inland, and then there's precipitation. Precipitation rains out, and then it can be stored in mountains. And in this case, it can be stored as ice, glacial ice in mountains. And for hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years, it's stored as ice until it melts out and then moves, um, moves out back to the oceans and the cycles start anew. So essentially glaciers are just a stop on the overall water cycle. And they also are a component of the cryosphere. The cryosphere is essentially just all the, the frozen water on Earth. So this is snow, ice sheets, shelves, freshwater ice, permafrost, ground ice. Um, where is the cryosphere distributed uh, globally? We can see that here, these different components the largest of which are the ice sheets, two big ice sheets are Antarctica and Greenland. And then there's also permafrost and snow and sea, sea ice, these other components. And we can see in Alaska, we have most of these cryosphere or frozen water components, except ice sheets and ice shelves. But if we look here, we can get some estimation of the glacial distribution. And we'll look um, in a little bit here at the distribution of glaciers across Alaska as well. So real briefly, um, some background info about glaciers. They're essentially just large masses of ice that form where snowfall accumulation is greater than the snowfall melt or the sublimation, sublimation being essentially when um, snow goes straight from solid to air without turning to water in the middle. And a little bit of background that might be fun for tourists or other people to know. Um, the, the history of glacier and glacier work goes back um, quite a while. Uh, the first use of the term glacier goes back to um, the 1500s in the Swiss Austrian Alps. And then this term burner, which just means old snow, and we'll talk about that. That's what is used to create glaciers. Um, goes back well over 800 years. And the first scientific study of a glacier was in Iceland and the Vatnajökull Glacier. And then some other scientific studies. The first study of velocity of a glacier, essentially how fast glacier was moving, was in the early um, 19th century in Switzerland. And then the first measurements of mass balance, that's essentially how big the glacier is. Is it getting bigger or getting smaller? Um, was also in Switzerland in the late 1800s. So glaciers in Alaska, where are they? If we look at this map here, we can see that they're primarily in South Central Alaska, going down to Southeast Alaska here. So the Alaska Range where um, Denali is, has many glaciers, Chugach Mountains in South Central, um, Wrangell St. Elias National Park has many glaciers. We do have some Arctic glaciers as well going up into the Brooks Range here. There's some Arctic glaciers and then a few in southwestern and northwestern Alaska as well. The bulk of the glaciers are here um, in that they um, 
are locations where precipitation accumulates. So there's um, accumulation of different um, different locations where they there's enough precipitation to feed the glaciers. And then if we look at the the same um, distribution of glaciers here, but in an image instead of the um, the the map here, we can see snow and ice also distributed uh, along the location here. Again, with most of the, the glacier ice in South Central and uh, Southeast Alaska, and then some going out into the Aleutian um, Peninsula as well here. How do glaciers form? Well, it's essentially all um, accumulation. It's about uh, snow accumulating. And as snow accumulates, it becomes denser. So it increases the, the density. And when that happens, it goes through this transition essentially squeezes out all the, the air bubbles that are in snow. So when snow falls, it's pretty fluffy and light, but then with time it can accumulate and become denser. And then if we look at this picture here, we can see the snow falls down from the, the water cycle and then it transitions into fern. We talked about this, this term fern. Um, and there are many different terms. And I think Rick mentioned that as well, that um, some of the older scientific terms go back to uh, some of the European studies, but Alaska Natives and others have um, other incorporations of glacial terms and studies of glacier that go back, glaciers that go back many thousands of years as well. Um, so essentially this fern then increases in density and as it becomes more dense, the ice bubbles are forced out and then it transitions to um, a glacial ice. And that glacial ice is just higher in density. And then when the, the fern is transitioned to glacial ice, that um, changes the, the properties. And this process usually takes anywhere from 150 to 300 years. It depends on the precipitation. Um, and just for comparison, the, the depth of this fern layer, which is essentially the depth before you get to true glacial ice, on Alaska glaciers, it's anywhere from three to four meters to more than that, um, depending on the, the glacier. But you can see it's um, not as deep as some of these other locations like Antarctica and Greenland, primarily because these places are drier. They don't receive as much precipitation. The glacier ice color, this is popular. A lot of people like to see the blue glaciers partly because they are, they're really interesting. They're, they're really stunning. Um, and this, is, this happens when the density of the ice increases, excuse me, well, when, when the snow transitions to glacial ice, the density increases. This forces out all the small air pockets. And then when light hits that really dense ice, all the other colors of the spectrum are absorbed. So it just reflects that blue light, which can be really prominent and um, really, really sharp and distinct and appealing. Briefly, we'll go over types of glaciers. There are different general types of glaciers and they're classified mostly based on their form and then their different temperature characteristics as well. So cert glaciers, these are glaciers that form in a, a bowl, essentially a cirque or this, this small bowl, not, not always small, but it's small relative to the landscape. You can see here, for example, here's a, a cirque glacier. And if they expand enough, they can become valley glaciers. And this is an example from down in Southeast Alaska by the Coast Mountains here by Gilkey Glacier. A uh, hanging glacier is one that has come down originally to a larger glacier, but it's pulled back and to the point where it's just coming up over a cliff and there's a little bit of it left and it's, it's hanging in space, hence the name. A valley glacier, these are quite common. You can have different kinds, simple and multi-branch valley glaciers. Uh, this is essentially just a glacier that is filling out um, and moving down through a valley. And here again, this is a, a good example of a valley glacier. This is in Southeast Alaska, Gilkey Glacier, and there are others in um, South Central as well.
transection glaciers is uh, an ice field. This is where glaciers have come together and they fill out a series of valleys um, and essentially connect and cover a, a valley system. And then Piedmont glaciers, these are very distinct. And we can see this is an example of the Malaspina Glacier, which is the largest Piedmont Glacier in North America. And one of the better known examples of um, glaciers in Alaska, one that a lot of people see. And a Piedmont Glacier happens when a glacier comes out and essentially reaches an outlet point where it's not physically confined anymore. So it's able to spill out and move laterally and you get this um, more teardrop or lobate formation that makes it distinct. And then a tidewater glacier is when a valley glacier comes out and reaches the ocean and then there's usually icebergs that calve into the ocean. You can also have a tidewater glacier that reaches a lake. So for example, Portage Glacier, which a lot of people go through in South Central Alaska, that's also a tidewater glacier. But in this case, it's calving out into a lake and their icebergs instead of the ocean here in South Central. Glacier change, uh, Rick mentioned some of this as well. And this is really interesting to see um, and people, something that people are interested in and there are many different examples of glaciers pulling back and most glaciers in Alaska are in retreat. There are a couple isolated cases, so there's a question potentially about gla some glaciers um, increasing in size. There are a couple like Taku in Southeast Alaska um, has been overall, but it's more localized due to precipitation changes in, in local areas. But for example, here's the McCall Glacier up in northern Alaska. You can see in the Brooks Range here in northeast Alaska. And this is just a, a comparison showing a photograph from 1958 and then um, 2003 as well. So you can see how much it has changed or retreated. And another example of glacial change, here's the, the Mendenhall Glacier. This is in um, southeast Alaska. This is very common for visitors, particularly um, those are coming up on cruises, see the, the Minnehaha Glacier uh, in the Juneau area. And you can see this 1958 photo where the, the lake in front of it is largely covered by the glacier. And then um, photo from 2011, you can see how much different the, the glacier is. It's pulled back, Nugget Falls here is exposed. And you can see just how how rapidly these glaciers are changing visually. You can um, really notice it as well without doing any specific measurements. How does that influence other systems? There are a lot of questions about what, what, do, what does it mean when these, these glaciers change? How important is it? What does it influence? Well, there are different um, factors and connections associated with glacier change. On this figure here, this just shows essentially how the glaciers are melting. So the, the loss in the mass or the size in glaciers, you can see different locations. And the big takeaway here is you can see that uh, there's a lot of glacier ice melting in Alaska. What does that mean in terms of things like sea level and other processes? This figure here shows that mountain glaciers, which we have in Alaska, are a, not a very big component of the overall cryosphere, the, the amount of ice and uh, that is susceptible to melt, but they are a large contributor to sea level. So even though they don't make up as much ice as the big ice sheets, they are um, more influential than the ice sheets for their contributions to sea level. And again, we can see that here as well with this, this figure that shows how much mass or glacial ice is being lost out of Alaska. And then real quickly, um, their changes in glaciers are also important for cultural components, um, hydropower, all kinds of other related activities. For instance, 
glacier water feeds fisheries, and that's very important to try to understand how glacier change is impacting fisheries. And then glaciers are also reservoirs records of climate change. This is some previous work that I've done that essentially just shows a glacier ice core from the McCall Glacier, and it's showing how um, over the last 50 to 60 years, as sea ice has retreated, as we saw in um, Rick's presentation, there's been a greater amount of precipitation contributed from an open Arctic Ocean. So these glaciers are also important records of past changes in climate and the cryosphere. And I will leave it there. Thank you. And um, I put my contact there if you have any questions. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. We did have a few questions. We'll hold them until the very end to see if we can um, sneak in our other two present presenters and then we'll come back. Um, but if you could put in the text chat for us your contact information or where someone can go to get more information, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you for sharing with us today. We're going to go ahead now and pass it over to Brandon to share with you additional information. And we can see your presentation. We can't seem to hear you yet. How about now? Can you hear me okay? Perfect, thank you. All right, sounds good. Okay, so this is a map showing the ocean basins and uh, continents of the Pacific area. And you can see all those black dots. Those black dots represent um, earthquakes locations and the white arrows represent um, vectors uh, for plate movement that are measured by uh, GPS. And so that's pretty exciting. We can actually, we can actually measure these uh, tectonic plates moving very, very slowly. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in to um, Alaska and you can see that Alaska has lots and lots and lots of earthquakes, more earthquakes than all the other 49 states combined, including the second largest earthquake ever recorded in 1964. That was a magnitude 9.2. There are three main fault systems in Alaska that generate these earthquakes. Uh, the one in Southeast is the Queen Charlotte system. There's a video there showing it's a, what we call a strike slip fault, similar to the San Andreas fault in California. There's also the Alaska mega thrust where the Pacific plate is, is being pulled into the mantle underneath the North American plate. And that generates the trench as well as most of the volcanoes in Alaska. And then inland away from the plate boundaries is the Denali fault system. It's also a strike slip fault like the uh, Queen Charlotte system is. So there aren't just lots and lots of earthquakes in Alaska. There's also lots of really, really large earthquakes in Alaska. Alaska is, is amazing in a lot of ways. One of the ways in terms of earthquakes is it averages at least one magnitude seven earthquake every year, which is far higher than other seismically active places in the United States. Um, so this is a map showing where some of those really, really large earthquakes are, those magnitude 7s and 8s, as well as the location of the magnitude 9.2 in 1964. The, plate, the earthquakes are generally following the plate boundaries. There's earthquakes that occur away from those, but the largest earthquakes are occurring right along those places where the Pacific and the North American plate um, are in contact. Now, the Denali fault system uh, for, the, for people working in the interior is a really unique uh, fault, and it's unique because it's sort of exemplified by the 2002 uh, earthquake, the magnitude 7.9. I still remember living here and, and feeling that uh, take place. It was a massive earthquake. Fortunately, it was, it was far away from most populated areas, so there wasn't a lot of infrastructure damage. But the uh, earthquake started uh, sort of on a fault that we didn't know existed at the time, and then it migrated along the Denali Fault and, and traveled for about 200 miles to the east toward Toke, where it took another right turn on a fault that connects with the Queen Charlotte Fault. So it was really unique and then involved multiple faults and it resulted in about 25 feet of vertical slip on either side of the fault as well as with all the shaking massive uh, landslides and mud flows and cracking ice and cracking uh, highways. So, um, but the, the amount of fault that ruptured, in other words, the amount of fault that split 
is about the entire length of the, of the um, or a large length of the uh, San Andreas Fault in, in Southern California. So if you have visitors from California who, who are earthquake uh, aficionados, then this is a, a similar size event that, that would be much more uh, damaging if it were to occur in, in, in California. One thing that I find myself doing, I don't know if you're, when you're talking about earthquakes to visitors, uh, is that you tend to use your hands a lot and you use your hands to show faults moving on side by side. And one thing that's important is, is sort of a metaphor of the, the deck of cards. And the reason why the deck of cards matters is because large earthquake faults don't actually slip side by side. They actually, there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of smaller fault planes along the, the stretch between these two big um, tectonic plates that accommodate that shear and they slip in different ways. And so if you think about talking about earthquakes, especially in Southeast with the Queen Charlotte fault, which is one of the fastest faults uh, in the world, that generates also really powerful earthquakes like the 7.8 in 2012 and the 7.5 in 2013. It's moving faster than the San Andreas Fault. All those red lines on that map, what they're showing are strands of that fault that are accommodating that shear. It's not just one plain crack in the ground that is accommodating that, just like a deck of cards that if you were to move your hand with a deck of cards in between, they would all move a little bit in different ways to accommodate that. And that's, that's real common with the Denali fault system and the Queen Charlotte uh, fault system as well. Something that's cool with earthquakes and faulting in between uh, the Queen Charlotte system in Southeast and Central Alaska, the big mega thrust uh, fault that produces the uh, volcanoes and big earthquakes is an area of Southeast with just enormous mountains. The St. Elias uh, range, the Eastern part of the Alaska range, the Chugash range, they, these mountains are rising faster than almost any other mountain range on earth. And they are affecting climate sort of inboard from that as they're blocking um, atmospheric patterns. But uh, St. Elias, for example, is over 18,000 feet. And the reason why those uh, mountains are rising so fast, I mean, to a geologist, 0.2 inches a year is just lightning speed, but uh, I know it's slow to, to that. But think, put this over sort of lifespans, and that's a, that's a big increase in uh, these mountains. The reason why that's taking place is because of a, of a block of rock, of volcanic and sedimentary rocks called the Yakutat terrain. And the terrain is a, is a group of rocks that are, that are found in a place that they didn't originate. So the Yakutat has sort of been riding along the Pacific plate for the last few tens of millions of years. And when it has uh, come in contact with Alaska, it didn't subduct with the rest of the plate. It's made of sort of more buoyant material. And so instead it's sort of crashing into and plowing into that, that corner of, of southeastern Alaska, generating these giant mountains like a snowplow would. If, you, if we move to the, the west a little bit, to this final plate band of this final fault system, the uh, megathrust, the Alaska megathrust, which generates this subduction zone, that's shown here, this really, really large 2,100 miles long it's where most of Alaska's volcanoes exist. It's also where most of Alaska's most powerful earthquakes have occurred from. That's the fault system there. If you notice those arrows on there, it's, it's, it's colliding with North America about 2.2 inches near Anchorage and uh, more than three inches all the way out into the West. These don't seem like big differences, but over hundreds of millions of years of geologic time, it can add up to a big difference in the way that the subduction works and, and the volcanoes that form. So here's another video I'm going to show it. It's going to show this, um, this uh, plate boundary in cross-section. And what you see is that you have this dense ocean plate made of iron and magnesium rich rocks. They are heavier and denser than the continental plate. They are colliding and it's being pulled into the mantle with gravity. And what's happening to the overlying tectonic plate, because tectonic plates are not just these rigid static pieces, they're actually very elastic and they can behave kind of like springs is that when regions of that, of that fault get stuck or what we call locked, then the, the ground surface can actually change. It can shrink, it can, um, it can uplift, in other words, go up, it can subside and go down. And then when you have those big earthquakes and the plate snaps back into place, it can generate a large tsunami, uh, which can then affect uh, people that live thousands of miles away from Alaska. So in 1964 earthquake, there were regions of the state that actually were thrust up um, tens of feet, and there are regions near Anchorage that were actually subsided or dropped down 
uh, close to 10 feet. So the purple areas are areas that dropped down during the earthquake and the greens and yellows and oranges were areas of the ground surface that were thrust up. And when you're driving around uh, near Anchorage, for example, you can actually see some of these places where the subsidence took place. There are these ghost forests near Girdwood when you're driving on the Seward Highway down towards, from Anchorage down towards uh, Seward where you have all these trees and just imagine before 1964, this surface of ground with the forest and everything else that lives there were about 10 feet higher than they are today. And they were further above sea level, but basically instantaneously in this 1964 earthquake, that ground surface dropped or subsided by about nine feet. And so the tide swept in from uh, Turnigan Arm and saturated those roots with um, salt water and killed those trees. And so now you just see these vast stands of uh, dead forest. Those aren't from um, climate change or from beetle infestation. That's from a big subsidence event that took place in 1964. Other areas that were thrust up, there's probably not a lot of visitors that are going to visit Montague Island out of Prince William Sound, but it's still kind of a cool story that this whole ocean floor uh, region that was originally 20 to 30 feet under water with barnacles and starfish growing on it during the 64 earthquake, that was thrust up about 30 feet. So there's a whole new bench of uh, beach near Montague Island and other places out in Prince William Sound that were thrust up. And so um, this, this uh, one event that only lasted a few minutes long in the earthquake um, and with a rupture zone of over 500 miles uh, caused major changes to the, um, to the local um, uh, ground surface. Of course, that thrusting of the ocean floor displaces a lot of water in the overlying ocean, and so it can generate a tsunami. And this is a video from NOAA that is describing the distribution of that tsunami wave through the Pacific over just a few hours. And what's important about this is that while 15 people lost their lives in the Anchorage area from that 1964 earthquake, 116 people lost their lives that were nowhere near uh, Anchorage. They were living along the west coast of the United States and in Hawaii that were affected by this uh, wave generated from this earthquake. So the subduction also created, besides massive earthquakes and tsunami, it also generates lots and lots of volcanoes in Alaska. There's over 200 volcanoes in Alaska. About 54 we consider to be historically active, which means there's actually a, a visual or written record of an eruption over the last about 150 years. Those volcanoes are in red on this slide. They're all labeled and the, the um, date that's underneath their name is the date of the last known eruption. Those volcanoes that I've highlighted in red, like uh, Cleveland here in the central Aleutians and Shishaldan located near Cold Bay and um, Pavlov and then Vinyaminov, those are active so frequently, we're constantly having to update this, this map that's available through the uh, Alaska Volcano Observatory and the State Geologic Survey, because they're just very active. Those are the four most active volcanoes in the arc. One of the things that, that you might get asked, at least that I get asked when I'm in airports and stuff and talking to people, is um, why, do, why do we spend so much time and energy monitoring volcanoes if no one lives out there? And it's a fair question. And the, the reason is, first of all, People do live out there, and so we want to work with our community partners to keep them safe. And the other reasons are, are the industries that are associated with, not, the, not just the fishing industry and the, the shipping industry in the ocean, but all of the air traffic that goes over the top from North America to Asia. There's 80,000 flights a year that are carrying people and goods that are traded and bought and sold. So we work closely with the FAA to monitor where those ash clouds are and to keep planes safe. Here's some pictures of some of the most commonly viewed volcanoes, especially from the Kenai Peninsula, or if you're down in, in Homer looking out at Augustine Volcano, it's one of the most active in Alaska. I put some dates of the most recent eruptions. 2006 was the most recent eruption of Augustine Volcano. Iliamna, as you, a lot of you already know, you can see really clearly from parts of the Kenai if the weather's right, but it hasn't erupted very often. It hasn't erupted that we know for sure of in the last 4,000 years or so. It's it's just a giant peak covered in um, ice. And so most of the activity associated with Iliamna are landslides or a special type of earthquake we call ice quakes as the glaciers move uh, down the slopes. In the lower left corner, this is Aniak Chak. This is, a, this is one of these super volcano types of volcanoes. It's a large caldera that formed about 3,400 years ago. 
It's only erupted, the most recent eruption of Antioch is 1931. In fact, this month is the 90th anniversary of the 1931 eruption. And on the Alaska Volcano Observatory website, there's different you know, things we've put together for people to sort of understand that a little bit better, but um, also hasn't erupted in a few hundred years before the 1931 er eruption. Readout, one of my favorite volcanoes in Alaska, erupt erupted last in 2009, before that erupted in 8990 over the winter um, in, uh, in uh, December and January, and then in the 60s and the early 1900s. Shishaldan has erupted so frequently, um, it's erupted at least 20 times since uh, 1900. And um, one of its largest eruption, a really, really un uncharacteristically large eruption occurred in 1999. I wanted to put Nova Eruptor on here, even though it's a very small picture for a very important uh, volcano. It's the event of the, of the world's largest eruption of the 20th century. And it's in Katmai National Park. And um, if, if your visitors are talking about hiking out or visiting there, it's a fantastic spot. Um, the uh, volcanoes of Alaska are forming due to this subduction zone, and the angle of the subduction zone is sort of uh, changes. It changes from very, very shallow in the east to much steeper in the west. So underneath Anchorage, the Pacific Plate is relatively flat line for a long time before it subducts, whereas way out in the west, it's, it's uh, much, much steeper. Those earthquakes you can see here sort of tell us about the plate geometries, the shallow earthquakes occur, in both the subducting plate and the plate that it's, that it's going under. The deeper earthquakes are almost exclusively in that cold, dense plate that is being pulled into the mantle by gravity. One thing that, that we get a lot of is why are the volcanoes forming there? And those arrows are pointing to the place in the mantle that partially melts to form that magma that then erupts. It's not the subducting plate that melts. It's actually the mantle itself that melts as that plate is subducted, it goes through metamorphism and it is releasing fluids and water into the overlying mantle and releasing those fluids lowers the mantle's melting temperature and it begins to melt into basalt and that percolates up to the surface. But there's a big difference from the volcanoes in the west to the volcanoes in the east in terms of that angle of subduction. So the volcanoes stay about 45 miles above where that, where that magma is generated in the mantle but the distance, the distance between the volcano and the trench continues to get larger and larger and larger as you move to the east. So they're quite different in how they erupt and how they form. This is a, this is a uh, time-lapse video of Shishaldan volcano erupting just a few months ago. And um, so it's one picture taken every five minutes for about three days. And it just shows a real typical Alaska volcano eruption. They kind of occur in stops and starts. They take place over days to weeks. They produce small lava flows. So this is, this is in January, so there's a lot of darkness uh, in, the, in the footage as the moon goes over the top. But yeah, so uh, small steam explosions, small ash explosions, um, small lava flows, and it just sort of goes for a period of maybe a week, maybe two weeks. But there's very little hazard to uh, planes flying over the top or, or fishing villages that live nearby. Most of the volcanic uh, activity is, is uh, kept right there close to the vent. And these are the kinds of eruptions that we typically see. We usually see three or five of these a year sometimes, sometimes less, but this typical uh, style. Not all of Alaska volcanoes erupt so uh, peacefully though. Uh, the 1912 eruption in June uh, was the largest eruption of the 20th century. It is often called the Mount Katmai eruption, although Mount Katmai didn't erupt until the very, very end. Most of the eruption occurred from a new vent called Novarupta. We didn't have a lot of geologists on the ground to understand this eruption very clearly, but it's, it's widely uh, talked about with local newspapers at the time. It's amazing to think of being in Fairbanks and, and being able to hear uh, the sound of the eruption. You can actually hear the thundering uh, explosions uh, being so far away. Um, in Juneau, hundreds of miles away, there was uh, ash fall, so much sulfur dioxide into the air that, that hanging laundry was disintegrated off the line in Seattle. It's a really uh, amazing, uh, enormous eruption, three cubic miles of magma erupted. And this is Kodiak uh, the day after. So I'll just leave you with some uh, resources if you're interested in more earthquake things or volcano things or geologic maps. These are good places to start or you can always email me and I'm happy to try to um, answer any questions you have that way. Thanks. Good luck this summer.
Thank you. I, and actually, the number one question that kept coming through is if you could provide a link um, for volcano information for folks that are interested. Is that yeah, the, the Alaska Volcano Observatory uh -huh. link? That's the that's the best place to start. Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Lots of great information coming in today. Welcome. All right, we are going to pass it over to Omega to take us through Aurora Borealis. All right, uh, thank you guys for coming. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, my name is Omega and I work for the UA Planetarium. So I'm happy to talk about the Aurora Borealis in a nutshell. I only have 15 minutes, so I'll try to get through as much information as possible. But first, I want to acknowledge that we are on traditional territory of the Denana people in Anchorage, Alaska. And I will be mentioning the oral history and traditions of the Aurora from the Yupik and Anupiaq peoples of Alaska. So. First off, no, many of us have actually seen the Aurora before, but I have a couple pictures. This one was actually taken this year. So we've had surprisingly active Aurora this year. And I say surprisingly because uh, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we're kind of at a solar minimum. And I'll explain what that means. So this picture was actually taken uh, by me during our last solar maximum. So I think that was about 2006 or 2007. And this was just a traditional run of the mill night up on a hillside in Anchorage, Alaska. I just uh, shot a couple frames of the Aurora just going crazy over Anchorage. And of course the Aurora has been viewed in Alaska for centuries. So this is an amazing um, painting done in 1911 of the Aurora Borealis, or sorry, in 1865 of the Aurora Borealis by Frederick Edwin Church. So let's get into the nitty gritty science of the Aurora. So the aurora is all dependent on the activity of the sun. This is a very important thing about the aurora, and this is how we actually predict how aurora is going to happen, too. Solar winds are plasma radiating away from the sun, and they radiate away in all directions, typically at a speed of about a million miles per hour. So that does seem like a lot. And uh, this is actually what creates a big part of our solar system called the heliosphere, which reaches all the way out to the Kuiper belt. So these solar winds will go all the way out to past the orbit of Pluto into the Kuiper belt. So solar winds actually affect aurora on other planets besides Earth. And these solar winds are caused by the magnetic sun. So our sun has a lot of magnetic field lines. So now we're familiar with the magnetic field lines of Earth. We have a north and south pole, but the sun has hundreds of north and south poles. And the sun actually twists those magnetic field lines based on how it rotates. Because the sun doesn't rotate all uniformly like Earth does. It actually rotates faster at the poles and slower at the equator. You can see in this diagram here, the average speed of the rotation all the way around is about 35 days towards the North Pole. And it gets slower to about the equator, which is about 25 days. So I know Earth rotates once every 24 hours, but if you imagine the sun being a million times bigger than the Earth, rotating in a matter of 25 days at the equator is actually extremely fast. Uh, so, sorry, I think I mentioned that it was faster at the uh, northern pole and slower at the equator. It's actually the opposite. It's slower at the poles and faster at the equator. So the equator actually has to move even faster. So it's got a longer, uh, distance to go around the equator and it's rotating even faster. So that causes the magnetic field lines of the sun to constantly change and they get twisted up. And these magnetic field lines will actually trap the plasma on the sun's corona, the sun's surface, into these magnetic field lines, which causes some pretty cool activity on the surface of the sun. So in this image here, I show a regular solar prominence. So solar prominence is something you can see on the edge of the sun. It's basically the plasma, all this hot material from the sun is caught in one of those magnetic field lines. And to scale, here is Earth. So we're talking about huge prominences. And when these, when a lot of this plasma gets stuck in these field lines, sometimes these field lines are getting so twisted up they can snap and this causes a solar flare. So it actually releases this radiation and plasma out into space. And these solar flares are typically associated with sunspots. 
and I will get to what a sunspot is here in a minute too. So they can last from minutes to hours. It's a lot of activity. So they release energy in light, so visible light that we can see, uh, and also in X-ray. So we can observe these using X-ray telescopes out in space. Sometimes we get a huge solar flare that releases so much plasma, we call it a coronal mass ejection. So that's material from the corona of the sun being ejected out into space. And this is where we get some pretty interesting interactions when this material starts interacting with the planets in our solar system. So these can have billions of tons of matter just released going super fast into our solar system. And coronal mass ejections don't have to happen from a flare. They can actually be independent from a solar flare as well. So these eruptions, coronal mass ejections, solar flares happen on the sun more frequently during certain times of a solar cycle. So here's a really cool video of an awesome coronal mass ejection happening from the sun. And most of these images I've showed you today come from the Solar Dynamic Observatory which is a space telescope that's actually orbiting around the sun. So it's not orbiting around Earth. It's out there by the sun. And I'll show some more videos of the Solar Dynamic Observatory later because you can actually check them to see exactly what the sun is doing uh, right now. Well, after the time it takes for the information to get to us because the sun is eight light minutes away from us. So transferring data back to Earth is gonna take at least eight minutes. And for us to actually process that data takes about 15 minutes total from the transfer of the information to get to us. So it's not the sun right now, it's the sun about 15 minutes ago. And another thing about the sun is even when there's not all these cool eruptions happening, you get all the solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Uh, when the sun is actually in its more quiet phase, there's still uh, things called coronal holes. And coronal holes, we can see in this image here, and I should mention that all these images are also using filters. It's not how you see the sun with your eyes. Uh, they're using filters to only have a certain wavelength of light um, so you can actually see these features better. So this filter here actually shows, you can see a lot of the uh, streaming coming out from a lot of these active areas, the brighter areas, more active areas. And then this cool dark area here is what a coronal hole is. So a coronal hole is basically like an opening in all the tangled field lines. So as the sun has all these tangled field lines as it's rotating, sometimes there's an opening and the material that would usually be caught in these field lines actually has a way to just go out and go out at a high speed. So coronal holes are a really good area where we have a lot of solar winds just fly straight out because they're not getting stuck in those field lines. So this is another way we can get some awesome aurora because we have a high density of fast solar winds coming out. And if one of these, they can last for over a month or even longer. So as it's rotating around the sun, it'll go out in all directions and eventually it'll come out towards earth and we get some of those higher velocity solar winds coming towards us. And uh, that can cause some cool aurora too. So the solar cycles are important. So I know you probably noticed that sometimes we have very little auroral activity and sometimes we have a lot of auroral activity. And that's because the sun goes through a cycle about every 11 years where it completely actually flips all of its magnetic field lines. So north will turn to south and all these field lines will get really tangled up during that flip. And that's when we have a solar maximum. So if we look at the sunspot cycles, this is actually how we track if the solar or the sun is in a solar maximum or solar minimum. We count how many sunspots there are. And sunspots are little dark areas on the sun they look dark because they're slightly cooler, but that's only because there's a lot of um, magnetic field lines bunched in that area. And that's where you get a lot of those solar flares happening. So sunspots is the way we count. The count of the sunspots makes us uh, see if it's a solar maximum or solar minimum. So you can see from this graph here that last year we're just coming out of solar minimum. We're going into another solar maximum. So this last winter, we actually had quite a bit of auroral activity from the activity on the sun. 
which is pretty exciting. And you can see the images of the sun here on this left image taken from 1996 to 2006. So this is a whole cycle of solar activity. You can see when the sun gets super active. So about 2001, 2002 was the last solar maximum in this uh, scale here. And then back in 2006, we could put back down to a solar minimum again. And now we're coming back up into uh, going into a solar maximum. So we can look for more aurora happening in the next several years. So the activity on the sun, that's what starts the chain reaction, which causes the beautiful aurora we see here. So then once this material leaves the sun, it now gets a new name. This is now called space weather. So any coronal mass ejection, the solar winds, solar flares that come out, we call that space weather because the weather changes and it is also predictable. And once it interacts with Earth's magnetic field, that's when we get some pretty awesome activity. So I have a little clip here from NASA to show what happens once that material leaves the sun and interacts with our magnetic field here on Earth. So you see the magnetic field lines here getting hit with that solar radiation, that plasma from the sun, and it actually starts to peel back some of our field lines. And as it peels it back, some of those field lines get bent. And when they connect together, they snap back. And that material in those field lines is a lot of charged particles and plasma. That material gets rocketed right towards our poles and that excited material, that plasma, those electrons will ignite the gas in our atmosphere very much like a neon light, except not with neon, with oxygen and nitrogen. So that is how we get the lights from the excited material in our own field lines. So that is a very important thing. It's not the actual material from the sun that is causing, that's hitting our atmosphere and causing the aurora. It's the sun's plasma bending our magnetic field lines from Earth. And when our magnetic field lines snap, the electrons in our magnetic field will shoot right down to our poles and cause the aurora. So that is one question I get a lot at the planetarium, especially people coming up here in the summertime, is when they hear about that it's radiation from the sun causing the aurora. And if it's more dangerous to live in an area with the aurora, it is not. So that material is actually coming from our own magnetic field. And here is a video of that reaction from the International Space Station. So this is looking at the International Space Station uh, flying over, I believe this is Europe right now, and you can see the aurora and where it is on our atmosphere. And there are lots of these videos. If you go to ESA, you can find many, many more of these videos of um, the International Space Station taking these very beautiful images of the aurora over Earth. All right, let me go to the next slide. Okay, one cool fact about the aurora is the northern aurora, aurora borealis, is an exact image of the southern aurora, aurora australis. That's because it's the magnetic field lines of Earth which connect the North and South Pole. They're identical field lines. So when that snap happens and those field lines shoot those charged particles back to Earth, it shoots them both at the North and South Pole identically. So they're mirror images. Whatever's happening with the aurora on the Northern Poles is happening exactly at the same time as the aurora on the Southern Poles, which is a really cool fact. Uh, the one thing about that though is usually when it's dark enough on the northern hemisphere it's too bright on the southern hemisphere to see the aurora and vice versa so when it's bright up here in the northern hemisphere like now during the summertime down in the southern hemisphere it's dark enough where they can actually see that aurora and here's an image from the south pole too and uh you might notice that there are several different colors of the aurora, and this is caused by the different chemicals in Earth's atmosphere. 
So depending on how strong the, uh, the solar winds are and how much radiation we're getting towards Earth and how much our magnetic field is being deformed will actually uh, give you different colors of the aurora. So the color of the lights depends on which types of gas the sun's so charging. I want to mention first that this is a video clip taken from a film called Kyugiat, which is about the aurora, which is something that the Geophysical Institute at University of Fairbanks and the UA Planetarium at UAA uh, both produced. And I have a link for that too. It's a free video that you guys can watch anytime. Particles run into. Green is most common and is caused by energized oxygen. Pale purple is from energized nitrogen, and red is energized oxygen at higher altitudes. Often, people see the purple lights as white or pale blue because the color is sometimes too faint for human eyes to perceive. All right. So the colors of the aurora, green is most common. That is a layer of oxygen um, at about 100 to 200 kilometers above the surface. And here's a great image you can see. You have the cloud cover down, you have where jet airplanes fly about 10 kilometers, the ozone layer, and then the aurora is a bit above that. So green is the most common one we can see. It is what shines brightest. It's easiest for our eyes to detect. But then we have the red aurora, which is oxygen at a higher level about 200 to 250 kilometers above the surface. So you can see a lot of the red. And then rarer is the purple aurora at the very bottom. So you get really strong aurora. You can see those arcs and those um, curtains of aurora happening. And you see kind of a, sometimes it just appears to be a white uh, bit at the very bottom. That is from the nitrogen at that level. So about 80 to 100 kilometers. And uh, as the video mentioned, sometimes people can mix all these colors together and it looks to be a white aurora. So I've had a lot of people ask me what causes white aurora. It's just our eyes perceiving these colors all at once. So it does look to be white. All right, so lastly, of course, most importantly, how do we predict the aurora? So back again, we can look at what the sun is actually doing. So this is very important. So I actually took these images from the Solar Dynamic Observatory they are what the sun was doing in the last 24 hours. So we can see these images here. So this is taken in a wavelength where we can see some of the more active regions of the sun. We can see the solar prominences on the outer edge of the sun. And uh, this one here is actually uh, with a filter that makes you see sunspots. So we actually do see some sunspots happening on the sun now, whereas in the last few years, there's been no sunspots. So this is great activity happening. And then on the right hand side here, this wavelength, um, which you can see the wavelengths on the bottom of these videos. This one is taken from the sun. You can see coronal holes as well, as well as those denser regions, these brighter regions where the magnetic field lines of the sun are really clustered together. And that's where you get some solar prominences and maybe some solar flares. All right. And we have several different resources that actually look at the information from the Solar Dynamics Observatories and other uh, telescopes out in space that are detecting this material. This one is a great resource. This is the space weather uh, station from NOAA, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We can see their predictions of the aurora, and this is taken from just today. If we look down here, we can see scale of the aurora activity right now. And guess what? <laughs> this right here, probably gonna be some aurora activity tonight, but um, let's see how dark it gets. <laughs> That's one thing. So the aurora activity actually does look very promising for tonight. And so this is a really great resource here. Um, one of the best resources is the Geophysical Institute located in the University of Fairbanks. And this will give you a map of what the aurora is supposed to be looking like over Alaska. It'll give you what's happening now. It'll give you what's happening in the next hour. And uh, it has several different ways we can look at what's gonna happen with the aurora. 
And I should mention the way they measure the aurora is called the KP index. So those are the numbers you really want to pay attention to. And you can see that right here, the KP index is just basically measuring uh, the geomagnetic activity in the atmosphere. So it goes from zero to nine. Zero means there's not gonna be any aurora. One, there might be a little auroral activity. Two, a little more. If you're in Fairbanks and it's dark in the middle of winter, uh, at one to two, you can actually see the aurora. Three or four is gonna be really great in Fairbanks. Uh, starting about three or four, you start to see it in Anchorage, so low to the horizon. Five means it's gonna be very visible in Anchorage. Six or seven means it's gonna be taking up the whole entire sky. Uh, and visible even down to the lower 48. So you'll get it down um, to the mid latitudes. When you get to an eight or a nine, that's when the magnetic activity in our atmosphere is so much, it'll actually interrupt telecommunications. You might get blackouts, you might get radio silence. That's gonna be bad. <laughs> so it's a good thing that we do pre uh, predict the aurora, not only for our own viewing pleasure, but also to protect our uh, infrastructure. And my favorite website to go to, um, just because it has a lot of other resources too, is spaceweather.com. And um, sorry, let's go back. So this is a great website. It'll take a look at all of the information from those satellites on the left-hand side here. And it'll also show you some amazing pictures and it'll tell you about any comets that might be in the sky, any meteor showers that might be in the sky and things like that. So those are three good resources. And then um, what I wanna talk about Last here is one other thing we can predict about the aurora is when it's going to be most active during the year. I'm sure with you being uh, tour guides and everything, people come up in the summertime in Alaska, they always ask when we can see the aurora, and you just got to say no. <laughs> Go to the southern hemisphere and maybe you can. So June, July is very, it just doesn't get dark enough to see the aurora. March and September, for some reason that astronomers don't quite know, is... Um, very, very active for the aurora sometime around the equinoxes. March is always a little bit better. So when you people ask what time to come up for the aurora, just tell them March. Okay, um, I know I am out of time, so just gonna list some resources there. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll put my, um, my contact information out as well so you guys can ask any questions. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And we did actually have a question that sure. you actually answered live, um, which is like perfect timing, which was really, where can we go to find information as well as where you think is the best place to do viewing? For the aurora? It depends on where you are in the state, the best place of viewing. Here in Anchorage, what I always tell people to do is just flat top or um, the Glen Allen Trailhead <clears throat> is a really good place to go. You just need to get out of city lights. So if you're inside the city of Anchorage, and you can't get out, uh, try to go to a local park where there's no street lights. Tell your neighbors to turn off their porch lights at night. Light pollution is a real thing. Um, Kincaid Park is great. Best place I've ever seen Aurora personally is in Houston, Alaska. So out towards Big Lake. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the great feedback and information. Folks, I know we are out of time. Um, but I did want to sneak one quick question in that came in for Rick earlier on. Um, Rick, the question that came for you was really around um, the rise in sea level, like what's what it's projected due to climate change and due to like the glacier melt. Are you still with us? And if you are, can you take just a minute to answer that before we call it a day? You bet. Um, this is Rick. Um, so that's a very, uh, it's a simple question and a very complex answer because it varies greatly around Alaska, as you might expect, given the size of Alaska. In southeast Alaska, where the land is still rebounding from the loss of the Ice Age ice, um, the land is rising faster than the sea level is going to rise anytime in the immediate future. Uh, on the other hand, land in southwest Alaska is actually subsiding and combined with rising sea level is a significant problem uh, in part because of course there's many communities there that are just barely above sea level now. So a very complex um, answer to a very simple question. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing. 
All right, everybody, we know the time is up. We greatly appreciate all of you um, for attending and thank you all for presenting, the five of you for presenting some great information today. Um, I also wanted to mention that we're gonna be collecting some resources and we are gonna be sharing this webinar that's recorded as well as some of those fantastic links that were shared for you today at the Alaska TIA.org site. So thank you all again. We will go ahead and sign off for the afternoon, but thanks for joining us and we hope you learned a lot of great information. Have a fabulous Thursday afternoon.